So that was a great leeway because we're going to talk about the rush exam now. Um, this is unlike sedation, which I teach because I have to. I love ultrasound. That is kind of my bread and butter that I like to teach. And so this um, topic has a lot of interest to me. We're going to move through this pretty quickly. I always like to start off with my life experience because this is one time where ultrasound truly affected one of my patients, and it just highlights the importance of how ultrasound can affect the management of somebody. So this happened to me probably about two years after I came out of residency, and it was a sign out from a very senior attending of mine that I had a lot of respect for. Um, but basically, I signed out. He told me we got a 63-year-old who came from a nursing home. She had just been discharged from the ICU for pneumonia. And she was returning back to the hospital because of fever, cough, and so she, they had kind of tucked her away. She was admitted to the ICU. He said, nothing else to do. Everything is stable. And as he was signing up to me, I looked up and I said, is that blood pressure real? Is she really hypotensive? And he goes, oh yeah, she's been a little bit low. You know, she's a dialysis patient. We're giving her a little bit of fluids right now, but her blood pressure has been fine. We think she's a little dehydrated because, you know, she was just in the ICU. She was just intubated. Um, so she really hasn't been getting a lot of nutrition. Her heart rate was fast. Um, I said, okay, and we just kind of moved on, and that was that. So we'll come back to that case in a little bit. Shock, definition of shock, it is a circulatory system when it is unable to meet the metabolic demand of your body. So in other words, these patients have maximized their compensatory mechanisms. Their heart rate is going as fast as it can. All of the things in their body have kind of optimized themselves, and it's not enough. These patients are actively dying on you. If you don't do something in the short term, these patients will die. Okay. ASEP has defined shock in saying the only variable consistent to show improved outcomes in the management, regardless of the cause of shock, is time to identification and time to intervention. So just looking at a little bit of the epidemiology, approximately 1 million patients present to the um, ER each year with shock. No one can tell you the mortality rate. It's anywhere between 35 to as high as 80 percent that I've read, um, but it's high. We know that shock kills a lot of people. And the majority of these shock patients are seen in the ERs before they go anywhere else. So we, as kind of the first providers, whether it's EMS, advanced practitioners, ER docs, we're the ones that are dealing with these patients. And so a lot of it falls on to us because, again, the most important thing about shock in the management is time to identification. So we're the ones that are supposed to identify and begin treatment. So here's the disconnect. We know what shock is. I mean, everyone in this room understands what's happening with shock. We know how to treat shock. If I told you a patient has cardiogenic shock, you know what to do. If I tell you they're in septic shock, you know what to do. Yet we continue to see these mortality rates that are astronomically high. And the question is why? Why are we seeing this big disconnect? There is a certain population that no matter what you do, you're not going to fix. You're never going to fix a 96-year-old who has heart failure who comes in in cardiogenic shock. You can't fix that. That's just a dying heart. There's nothing you can do that's going to improve that outcome long term. What I'm talking about are not those patients that are just kind of on their way to natural death. So I think the disconnect for a lot of emergency rooms is the lack of rapid recognition and treatment. So one of the things we know what shock is, if someone comes in, they have a blood pressure of 60 over 40, their heart rate is 140, we know they're in shock. It's the cryptic shocks that we are not good at recognizing. It's the 20 year old who comes in, they have a normal blood pressure, they're just a little bit tachycardic, and we understand that they may not be normal, but we're not calling them shock right off the bat. So some signs you need to be looking for that would identify someone with cryptic shock, confusion, altered mental status, uh, abnormal vital signs, you know, tachypnea may be the only sign of a patient becoming in shock. Maybe a DKA patient who's just presenting tachypnic, but they're already in that shock state. Narrow pulse pressure, you know, you know about it in trauma, narrow pulse pressure, hemorrhagic shock, but any type of shock can lead to it. Decreased cap refill, you touch the patient's extremities and they're cold, you know, that could be a sign of shock. And then decreased urine output if that is something they give you or something you're able to monitor in the ER. So our four categories of shock, you know, the ones that we most commonly see broken up into is hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive, and distributive. And I'm going to kind of walk you down kind of my approach to this shock management. And then we're going to tie an ultrasound to it to show you guys how to kind of tie in the rush to it. So the first thing I always look at is the heart rate. Um, always be weary of someone who is tachycardic. you got to determine whether the tachycardia is the cause of the shock or shock is leading to the tachycardia. It can be either or. So typically, if the patient's heart rate is greater than 170 and it is not a sinus rhythm, which typically if it's greater than 170, it's not going to be sinus, that's probably going to be the cause of shock. 
So your heart is beating too fast, and you're not allowing for that diastolic filling, that diastolic time. And so if you don't allow the heart to fill, you're not allowing the heart to pump out blood. Um, and so usually these are gonna be treated with electricity, okay? So these are your unstable um, supraventricular tachycardias, your AFibs, your A-flutters. These are your um, unstable arrhythmias. Okay? If the heart rate is less than 170, you're talking about a heart rate of 120 and 130, Typically, that's not going to be the cause of shock. Okay, so usually that's secondary to shock. That's your compensatory mechanism. So it's very important to understand the heart rate in conjunction to what is happening with the patient. So once you've said, okay, the heart is not the heart rate is not the cause of the shock. We think that the shock is leading to the heart rate. The next thing to look at is volume status and heart function. And this is kind of the leeway into what Dan was talking about. The way that we traditionally did it, and this is before ultrasound, is you would take a patient, you'd look at the blood pressure, you'd look at the cap refill, you'd tie in some kind of estimation into your head with all these things and say, okay, I think this patient is volume down. Okay, I think their hypotension is related to a volume problem, so I'm gonna give them a liter of fluid. And that was our typical response. You talk to an ER doctor, they see a blood pressure of 70 over 50, give them a liter of fluid, let's see what happens, okay? Um, if they happen to be a dialysis patient or a heart failure patient, for whatever reason, we said, let's just half that. We'll give them 500 cc's of fluid and see what happens. So that's kind of what I call old school medicine to treating shock initially. Better way, ultrasound, okay? Actually seeing what you're doing. So the excuses I've heard, one, I don't have any training in ultrasound, okay? Two, we don't have an ultrasound at my shop and there's no way for me to get it. So. For number one, I'm not gonna try to sell it right now, but if you are practicing in the emergency room today and you're not using ultrasound, you're behind the times, okay? 10 years from now, if you're not using ultrasound, you're probably gonna be going against standard of care. So we are in a transition. 10 years ago, I could not say that. Now, standard of care, you have to use ultrasound for ultrasound guided, that's standard of care. If you're not doing it and you have a complication, you're gonna have a hard argument as to why you are not using it. It is now, the FAST exam is now part of our ATLS recommendations. Um, the RUSH exam is now being part of the ICU recommendations. ASEP is on board with using ultrasound for a lot of these initial diagnoses. So we're at the point now where ultrasound, this is the time if you're not using it, you need to get trained on it. And there are courses across all of ASEP, SAEM, even GSEP offer courses. So, I mean, there are courses that can get, you can go to get training for this, you need to. And I'm not talking about advanced ultrasound, just basic ultrasound. Okay. Um, Machine-wise, these are two machines that have just come out. One of them's coming out this year. So the far one on the right of the screen is the butterfly. It's gonna cost $2,000, plugs into your iPhone, um, and that's coming out this year. The other one is a Lumify. It's the one that we use at our shop. It's $4,000 and plugs into an iPad, or um, a Samsung pad. So, you know, if you can't afford it at the hospital, they should be able to fork over $2,000 for an ultrasound machine. There's really no excuse not to have one when you're working with patients in the ER. Okay, and it's going outside the ER as well. So going back to your patient has hypotension, their low blood pressure, you've got to find out why. First thing that I do is I take a look at their central venous pressure. So go back to it really quick. So basically you're just taking a sub xiphoid shot, long axis, right where the IVC is. And in this case, you're looking at the IVC as it's going into the right atrium, transversing through the liver, and you're looking at the collapse during respirations. So I'm looking at big picture diagnostic skills, okay? I'm not looking at minutia. So anywhere between, you're looking for this IVC to collapse anywhere between about 20 to 80%, okay? As long as it's collapsing between 20 to 80%, I'm happy. What I'm not happy about is where it's flat and you can tell it's just completely collapsing with respiration, or it's not collapsing at all. Okay, so that's a normal example. Over here where I said CVP low, you can see that that one is almost undetectable versus the one on the high side, which it's not collapsing hardly at all during this patient's breath. So big picture things. You can estimate central venous pressure simply by looking at this IVC. So if it's flat, those walls are completely touching during respiration, CVP is gonna be anywhere between zero to 10. Okay, it's low. Um, if it's high and it's not collapsing, it's greater than 20. Anything in between, I don't really care. I consider it normal. The next thing I do is I take a look at the heart. And again, I'm not looking to be a cardiology sonographer on this. I'm just looking for big picture things. So anywhere you can get a picture of the left ventricle, get it. And 
basically you're just looking at the left ventricular squeeze. So this is a normal one. Anywhere between 50, 60, 70%, I'm happy with that. Okay, again, big picture points. Over here you can see low CVP. You can see the difference. The heart is barely squeezing at all. I mean, that's an EF in that case of probably about 10%. And then you can see the hyperdynamic EF where it's almost completely collapsing. You see absolutely no diastolic filling in that heart at all because it's just compressing completely. So big picture, that's what I'm looking at. So how do we use it? Okay, so our patient comes in, they're hypotensive. We look at the heart, the heart is hyperdynamic. We know this heart has completely maximized the amount it can squeeze. I can't make that heart squeeze anymore. If I went and I tried to give this patient dobutamine, it's not gonna do anything. I can't make a heart that's squeezing 100% squeeze harder than 100%, okay? So I know this heart is squeezing as hard as it can. Ejection fraction, 100% for all intents and purposes. Cardiac output, prone, because we have no diastolic film. I look at the IVC, that IVC is almost undetectable. So I know the problem is probably not the heart in this case, it's the heart doesn't have enough volume, okay? It's not getting enough blood to the heart. So I'm looking at either hypovolemic or distributive shock. So now I have eliminated two of my categories of shock. Okay, I know it's not cardiogenic, and I know it's not obstructive because that IVC is tiny. So then you gotta move on to the next step. Okay, we know they're hypovolemic. Are they hypovolemic because they're in septic shock? Are they distributive shock from anaphylaxis? Are they hemorrhagic shock from trauma? And that's where clinical integration comes into play. Okay, I can't tell you what to do at this point. You have to use your clinical context. So the patient is 60 years old, they came in complaining about plate pain and they're hypotensive, go and do a AAA scan on them, okay? Look for a AAA. The patient is a 20-year-old female and they came in and they said, my last period was you know, three months ago and I've been having vaginal bleeding and they're unstable, go look for an ectopic pregnancy, do a FAST exam. So you gotta use your clinical context of what to do next, but then you go and start looking for other causes of why this patient is hypovolemic. Um, so again, it's very dependent on the patient history. Treatment depends again on the cause. If it's a trauma patient, blood's going to be the treatment. If it's septic, you're going to give them fluids and pressors. So it should tailor your treatment. It's not going to tell you how to treat the patient. So my approach is very similar to McCollum's. I give them boluses of fluid, but I don't guess. So I give them a liter. You know, their IVC is flat. They're hyperdynamic. I give them a liter, and then I have to recheck their IVC. If it's still completely collapsing, I give them more fluid. There's not a number. I don't say I stop at three liters. I don't say I stop at 10 liters. I give them fluid until their IVC is somewhere collapsing between that 20 to 80% mark, okay? I don't care if they're a dialysis patient. I don't care if they're a heart failure patient. As long as I get that collapsibility between 20 to 80%, I know the tank or the IVC is full from that standpoint, and then I move on. If they're still hypotensive after I've resuscitated with fluid using ultrasound, then I'll go to pressors, and I always you know, do the push dose epi just to kind of see how the patient responds, and then I'll put the monitor from that standpoint on. All right, so here's another example. So again, we have hypotensive patient put into the ER, hyperdynamic left ventric ventricle function again, so that heart is squeezing as hard as it can, but the difference on this patient is their IVC is huge. It's not collapsing at all. So now, I can't say this is a volume problem, right? This patient has volume. If I give this patient fluid, Am I really doing anything? Maybe, but not a tremendous amount, okay? Because they have volume, they have fluid, that's not their problem. So why do they have blood on the right side? We know they're getting blood to the heart, but not getting it to the left side, it's an obstructive process, right? So this is where you guys start thinking tamponade, tension pneumothorax, massive pulmonary embolism, things that would lead to an obstructive process. Okay, and so that's where your differential goes. Now you take your ultrasound, go look for a pneumothorax, go look around the heart to see if there's a pericardial effusion. Go look at the heart, see if the right side of the heart is massively bigger than the left side of the heart. And it's gonna lead you down a direction to figure out what's going on. It's not gonna tell you the answer, okay? You can see a big right side of the heart and think it's a PE, but it may just be pulmonary hypertension from chloropulmonal. So you don't know, but it leads you into a direction. But you know that giving this patient a tremendous amount of fluid probably is not gonna help the patient all that much. Okay. Unless it's tamponade, probably not the best thing. So you treat the underlying cause for that. Okay, third case, we have this heart. This is a patient in heart failure. So you can see they're not squeezing very hard. The IVC, completely dialed. Okay, this is cardiogenic. Okay, cardiogenic shock in this case. So you go look at a better view of the heart. This is where you can start doing a little bit more advanced, looking at your walls, seeing this patient has acute heart wall motion abnormalities. Look at the valve, see if there's any indication for severe aortic stenosis. 
big picture things. You don't, again, you don't have to know a ton about um, echocardiography to know how to look for these things. And then the treatment, again, depends on what you find. So inotropes, you can start go butin. You know the heart's not pumping well, give them medication that gets it pumping a little bit better. Give them the calcium. We know calcium, of course, is an inotrope as well. Um, you can add additional pressors if those inotropes are not working. And then you can transfuse blood depending on, you know, which criteria you read, eight to 10. Um, you know, for us, more like the eight is what I'm using more now. All right. And then the last case, so you see this, which, you know, it's collapsing, but it's, you know, it's not flat like we saw before. So this patient, a little bit volume down, but not severely. You really don't, you know, it could be anything at that point. So again, big picture thing, if it's not flat and it's not huge, then you really have to go and take a step back and look at the whole picture again. Um, but that was really just to show you, you know, big take home on it. I'm not looking for kind of the small minutia. So normal IBC, where it's not a massive difference between the large and big, think of everything and just start your workup from there. Those patients, you know they can tolerate fluid. So if you put it all together, that's basically what we talk about with the rush exam. It's using ultrasound to guide your resuscitation for an undifferentiated hypotensive patient. Again, it doesn't give you the answer, it just gives you pieces. It helps you rule out. So really being able to say, I know this patient's in shock, but I know it's not cardiogenic shock, that's a lot more information than you have from the get-go. So just use it to help you move through your differential. Kind of the four things that we talk about with the rush, cardiac evaluation and IBC are the first two. And then from there, you basically go, depending on what those two show, and look for the rest of the stuff. So again, if the patient has an obstructed picture, you're gonna go to the lungs and look for pneumothorax. You're gonna go to the heart and look for tamponade and right heart strain. If you find out that this patient is hypovolemic shock, then you go looking for blood in the abdomen, other things like that. Um, all right, and then, you know, distributive shock. Um, if everything, if your peripheral vascular, this is the last thing I look at, so step three. After I've looked at the heart rate and determined that that's not the cause of the shock, I've resuscitated them from the standpoint of volume and heart function. Then you look at your peripheral vascular resistance, um, and that's where you can start adding pressures on. So going back to my patient, you know, this is the patient that I was told, I think this patient has a pneumonia. They just came out of the ICU for a pneumonia. They're hypotensive tachycardic. We think it's all septic shock. We're giving them fluids. They should get better. The first question I asked my resident, and I said, what does the IVC look like? And he goes, I don't know. We have an ultrasound of them. So after the attending left, we went to the room, and I said, let's look at it. He looked at the IVC, and this is what he saw. Okay, at this point, the patient had had one liter of fluid, um, and she was a dialysis patient. But um, we looked at that, and I said, what do you think? And he goes, well, I think she's got enough fluid. So I said, okay, what do you want to do? He goes, let's start pressors. I said, not yet, let's go look at the heart. So he went and looked at the heart, and this is the picture he saw of the heart. Okay, so again, this was a dialysis patient who had just gotten out of the hospital for pneumonia. Um, at this point, you know, she was hypotensive, big IVC, fluid around the heart. I don't care anymore about all the fine details. This is tamponade for me until proven otherwise. I don't have to go looking for right ventricular collapse or right atrial collapse or the other things that cardiologists talk about. I have enough information. I called the cardiologist down and I said, listen, I got this patient. She's got fluid around the heart. She's hypotensive. She's not having, she's, her IVC is not collapsing. They took her straight to the cath lab, put a window into that pericardial sac, and she ended up not having pneumonia because they ended up CTing her later, looking for PE and stuff. This was her problem all along. Any questions? I know it's a lot to cover, but I had to get there pretty quickly. Again, I can't teach the ultrasound component of it, but I do encourage you guys, you know, if you're working in the ER, get some kind of training in ultrasound, um, and really just doing one or two days of scanning patients and getting a few lectures will be enough, and then you just go start practicing it, and it kind of comes together on its own. All right, thank you guys.